Hello, and welcome to The Book Table by Backroom Whispering Productions. Today, we'll be discussing The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. My name is Rebecca, and I'll be your moderator today. We've got some familiar voices and some exciting new voices, so let's get started with a brief introduction for everyone. And after you've introduced yourself, please let us know if reading this book in June for our online book club was your first time reading or if it was a reread for you. So I'll go ahead and get us started. I'm Rebecca, one of the familiar voices around here. I'm from South Bend, Indiana. And this was my first time reading the book when we read it in June. So I had those fun, fresh new eyes. Hi, uh, I'm Christopher. This is my first time on the podcast, so thank you. Um, I'm from Atlanta, though I'm currently in Pasadena, and this was uh, the second time I've read The Name of the Wind. Hi, I'm Ed Lent. I'm one of those familiar voices. I've been on here a lot. Uh, I'm currently in Richmond, Virginia, and this was my mm, something like fourth time reading The Name of the Wind, and I have also read the sequel, but I did reread it after rereading The Name of the Wind again. And my name's Emma. Um, I am from the U.S., but I'm currently in Japan, and this is my first time reading The Name of the Wind. Okay, and I'm Shelly. I have been on a few book tables before. Um, I don't think the last episode. Um, yeah, I'm in Atlanta right now, but shortly moving to Maryland. Um, yeah, this is my second time reading the book. My first time listening to the audiobook, which was fun. All right, awesome. And last but certainly not least, um, our wonderful friend Sarah is back with us today, but is having some technical difficulties. So I'll be reading her real-time comments as we're having this discussion. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the first question, which some people have sort of already answered, is um, how we read this book. So it was a physical ebook, audiobook, um, first time reread. We covered the first time and reread. So, okay. Um, so I read, or I didn't read, I listened to the audiobook. And as I said, this was my first time. Um, so that was an interesting experience. I loved the audiobook. The narrator was amazing. But I do have to say, I think it's important that I listen to the audiobook because when we get into discussing some things later, including things that bothered me, um, the length of time that it took between certain things when listening to the audiobook, I think, contributed to the way I felt about it, which might not have happened as much if I had been physically reading the book as I flip through books much more quickly than I listen to audiobooks, obviously. Uh, so how about everybody else? How'd you read? Yeah, I was um, also, the reread I did on the audiobook, the first time was a combination of audiobook and ebook because WhisperSync is very cool. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed the audiobook. I thought the narrator did a good job of um, of narrating the story and differentiating the characters and everything like that. Yeah, I'm the same way. Uh, especially the first time I read it, uh, way uh, it was probably a year or so ago. I was uh, flipping between the audiobook and the ebook, and I eventually fell kind of just into the audiobook only because I think the conceit of the novel, the way it's constructed really lends itself well to the audiobook. So this time when I did the reread, all I did was listen to the audiobook. It was also convenient because I could listen to it at work and have be hands-free. Yeah, so I also did the um, the first time read with the ebook, and then this time with the audiobook. And I really, t I tend to like audiobooks that are in first person or like majority in first person, so I think it worked really well. As I said, it's my first time reading it, and I was reading the actual physical book. I like physical books. I read ebooks because hard to have physical ones when you're traveling and stuff but what if I can get a physical one I tend to go for it. So this was Sarah's first time reading and she read the ebook um, because if you listened to our how do you book podcast last month you'll remember that Sarah's a big fan of ebooks. All right so let's talk about world building in this book because I know it has been praised a lot for world building. Uh, so did you feel like the author did a good job of world building? And I'll go ahead and throw in my really quick thought here at the beginning. And my thought is, yeah, I thought the world was really cool. I liked that you were just absolutely thrown into it. And at first, not a lot was explained. Um, I love immersive world building stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I also, I thought the, the world building was great. Uh, like I said, it it's, feels very believable right from when you start reading it. Um, I mean, it's a bit heavy on on place and people names, but that's pretty much par for the course with a lot of, of fantasy novels. Yeah, I'd agree. What I really liked about the world building of this novel is that 
there were equal parts of the world building of things kind of like magical elements like and lore and mythos like the Chandrians and the stuff like that but then there's also just sort of everyday life we spend a lot of time in different sort of towns and villages and you see how everyday life is different in each of them and what I also think was interesting about the world building of this novel is what get called like subgroups and subcultures so the tiny little cliques of people who are all interested in very specific things and it's not even just the magic school when we get there it's just even in the little towns the people who are like tailors or who are musicians they've been established they've been here a while you see how it all works i think that really made the world of the name of the wind just feel so much more real and kind of tactile yeah I, i'd agree with that you get a very good sense of this you know these are the edema Roo, these are the seals these are the you know these distinct people in addition to like you said all the the various professions and um and the towns and, and all that kind of stuff yeah, it's, I think, easier to immerse yourself in a world when it feels like it's been lived in. You know, people have been hanging out there. Life has been going on before this story took place, and life will continue on after. I would wanted to agree with what uh, Mad said in terms of it being very tactile. I felt like um, you could sort of, like, reach out and touch whatever building he's in. And I think that really helps set the world up as a real world. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think because the way the, the novel is constructed, um, it's kind of easy to to learn about the world since you you start in a very fairly well fairly simple setting um you know just in a tavern when we get into the real like meat of the story we kind of experience new things as quoth does so it's kind of easier to learn about them because our main character is also learning about you know the the university or things like that so um i think the construction sort of helped uh with the world building yeah awesome and sarah's thoughts on this are um that we're kind of thrown into it, for example, with references to wars and stuff that we don't know details about, with basically no exposition explaining the setting, but I tend to like books that let readers figure out and fill in the gaps for themselves. For me, it makes it feel more real to be dropped in suddenly. I also agree with everything Mad said about the balance between everyday life and subgroups. It really fleshed out the world. So awesome. And actually, going back then, Shelley, to your comment about the conversation sort of between the world building and the construction, let's talk about the construction for a minute. So the novel is a mix of first person and third person narration with the third person sort of in this present day and the first person is this uh, flashback sort of different timeline um, of both telling his own story. Um, So how did you guys feel about that? I know it was really interesting for me from sort of a meta storytelling perspective that you have, first of all, like a sort of omniscient third person narrator that you're getting to know these characters with, but then you also have Kavoth's understanding of himself and his own story and sort of the question of how authentic that is and is he a trustworthy narrator, um, which I think we're going to get into a little later, um, but... I actually really loved the interplay between the two and sort of the layers that it added to the story itself to have these two different perspectives about this one character. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And it, it it's amazing how well it sucks you in because there are a couple of points in the story um, where the his narration gets interrupted and you feel like you were sitting there listening to somebody and then all of a sudden you get kind of yanked out of it back into the larger world of the inn and what's going on there. Um, and it's it's an interesting kind of first person because it's very much a story being told instead of just this person talking about their life, you know, the way maybe another or a different kind of first person narration would be. Yeah, I think the first person narration of this novel, the way kind of like you said, Chris, it gets interrupted and it's interspersed with other things. It makes it feel more organic. Uh, For me personally, I go camping uh, with my dad and my brothers and we love to tell stories. And it felt very much kind of like you're just sort of sitting around a campfire telling stories feel. I thought it was just so interesting. It was something I hadn't really experienced, at least not in the way that Rothfuss did it. And I think it made the entire reading experience more enjoyable. Uh, for me personally, I know that whenever something's first person and that character uh, whose perspective we're in, it's very clear that they are narrating a story to us. I'm immediately going to assume the the uh, narrator is unreliable. So Well, and he acknowledges it, it even himself within the story where there are moments where he says, 
okay, I'm, I'm just not going to talk about that and we're going to move on to something else or this is not important to me. So not only his reliability, but what he is prioritizing within his own story is is very clear and transparent as, as you're reading through the book. You know, my assumption, especially, you know, have, now reading through the, book the second time, once you have a sense of his character is that, you know, everything he does, especially when it comes to the storytelling, is, is calculated. There, the, None of that was... Um, unintentional or, or him casting around because he didn't, you know, really didn't know where to start. Yeah, I think the like construction of the first person and the third person is really interesting in that because you're constantly reinforced that it is a story that you're being told and it really helps you to like sort of acknowledge in your head and, and make you question as you're reading it how much is true or not. Um, sometimes with first person novels or narration, you sort of I don't know, when I'm reading them, at least I get stuck into the story, and then I have to, at the end I go back and like, wait, how much of this was true or not? Um, whereas this time, even though it's the first time reading through, like right away I'm questioning what I'm being told by him because I'm reinforced that it's a story that's being told. Yeah, I thought the different perspectives were really well done. Um, like when you're in when you're in the story within the story, um, you feel like it's actually happening, you know, in the current time and then sort of when you get pulled out you suddenly remember that oh this is actually you know being told from several years later and I also always felt like whenever whenever we were interrupted oh I just want to go back to that story I don't really want to know what's happening in the present time because it's not quite as interesting as what was going on in the, the the past I definitely agree with that Shelley like I think that definitely helped me keep reading and being stuck in the story is that every time the present came in I was just like wait no, go back. You're, you're talking about something more interesting. Go back to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Sarah uh, found the um, mix between the first and the third person really interesting. She says, uh, my favorite thing about this was that as the flashback story progressed, you could start to see the influence on Cote or Cote, however it's said, um, and the way he acts or even the way the writing refers to him. Also, I tend to vastly prefer third over first person narration, but as Chris and Matt have said, the story in a story format made the first person seem really natural, and I enjoyed it because of that. So has it changed your feelings about the story to have a possibly unreliable narrator? Do you have to have complete trust in your protagonist in order to enjoy the story and their perspective? And my answer to that is actually, I find it really interesting that you can't necessarily completely trust both in this instance um that's what makes the story interesting and i think what makes some of the discussion that we'll be having in the spoiler section more interesting is thinking about the interplay between the world as it is and what might have actually happened in kavoth's life versus the way he's telling it to you uh as a reader and by to you as a reader i mean to the chronicler in the story and one of those things is how he just kind of seems to like be really good at everything all the time um, and has this sort of like untouchable kind of mythos to him. Something that I, I took for granted that he was just being truthful the first time through the book, but the second time on the reread, having a better sense of his character, you do start to question it. I, I do think that, especially when he's talking, you know, he's giving this story of his life to Chronicler, he does have an earnest desire to really tell his story and tell it as accurately as he can. But inherently, as you know, as we all do, he's trying to make himself look better. He's trying to, you know, cast his um, his actions in the most positive light possible. But I, I don't know if I would agree with the, the assessment that he's maybe intentionally um, skewing things um, to make himself, you know, look better in, in hindsight. Maybe it's not always to put himself in a good light. Maybe it's to put other people in a good light or to make some people seem worse than they already are. We don't really know because we're only getting his perspective. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing some of the things that we've heard the Chronicler say about both coming through. Um, you get a lot of his sort of legend near the beginning of the book. I kind of want to see how those events get played out in, in his story. Yeah, and Sarah's thoughts on this are, this was my first read, and like Chris in his first read, it never occurred to me not to trust him. Maybe since he keeps saying that he's telling it 100%, I didn't think to doubt it like at all. Actually, I've never thought about that as something that can happen with first person. 
but hearing Mad, it makes a lot of sense and seems like a fun way to approach that narration. It would be really interesting to read it again with that mindset and think about what might be changed or left out. I agree with Emma and Chris that it's probably more subconscious exaggeration, though. The most helpful thing for me, I imagine there are a number of female characters who don't really have naturally red lips in real life. Because, really... <laughs> AKA Sarah is my hero. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, that's good. You made such a big point yeah, about that. that, too. So, this book became something of an overnight success to the point that it's now often called a classic of the genre, even though it's relatively new. Um, so, why do you guys all think that is? Um, and my thoughts are going to be short and brief because I was one of the few people in the entire world that didn't like actually super enjoy this book. Um, but I think part of it is sort of the scope of the story and the really clever narration. Um, and I think uh, he did, the world was really interesting. The world building was really interesting. And it sort of hit on all the classic fantasy tropes while still being its own thing, which is really cool. And I do think that Rafus is a really masterful writer and that it was a masterful story. Um, and hopefully you guys will flesh that out more. I just, there were certain things about it that really turned me off and I never got fully turned back on. Yeah, I, I sort of go along with that. I think it does, it, it feels like a, you know, a classic fantasy novel without really you being able to say, oh, that's Tolkien, that's Le Guin, that's, you know, without pointing those things out. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a really great read. I just find myself, especially listening to it narrated that, um, he's a, he's a very talented writer and the, the narration and the writing seems to flow very well. I mean, can somebody else confirm this? This was his first novel, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty okay. impressive. Yeah. That's what I first, thought for a debut. That it became an overnight success doesn't surprise me too much. I think just when I first started reading it, I realized I went, wow, the quality of the writing really is so good. Okay, I get it. And I think the fact that it became this sort of overnight success and now considered a classic, even though it is so new, I think it's because, um, kind of like you said, Rebecca, it hits a lot of things that we associate with sort of classic Hallmark fantasy in a way. I look at this book and I go, you want a hero's journey? Here's a hero's journey. You want a magic school? Here's a magic school. In a way, he took all these things that I think lots of fantasy readers love about very specific different fantasy series and kind of smashed them all into one book. And yet at the same time, it feels so wholly his own. And I can't quite put my finger on how it was he did that, but he did. And so the fact that it's now really just considered a classic, it sort of doesn't surprise me anymore. Just after now having read it, I go... Yeah, kind of hits all the things that people who read fantasy really want. Yeah, I think the other thing that's kind of interesting is not only does he give us all of these things, but you don't get too much of them, if that makes any sense. Like like Tolkien, like say, is a stickler for detail and will give you a paragraph on a you know tree branch or whatever, but you don't get that. You get a little bit of detail enough to know that, okay, this is, you know, we've d dove in a little bit, but... Um, not so much that you, you get bored. Yeah, um, I can't remember who knows. Someone made a point that you can't point out, uh, I guess it's Rebecca at the beginning, you can't point to any one thing and say this is like a specific author's influence. Um, and that really helps it stand on its own as well as still having all of these classic sort of tropes of like the narrator with the distinctive characteristic, cough, red hair everywhere. Um, but it does stand on its own to to most of an extent. I'd have to say the only thing that I felt was very sort of an obvious influence was the prologue and epilogue, uh, where he's talking about the three silences and going on sort of very, it felt very uh, Robert Jordan-esque. Robert Jordan always has the wind coming through at the beginning of his book and sort of setting the scene. Everything I I think has kind of been covered, but I guess just the the combination of the different parts that you know we all love in separate books, and then sort of putting the twist on it with the narration and the way it's it's set up as a story in a story, just that that kind of thing really is I guess more intriguing than the standard fantasy novel that might have you know one of these one of these aspects you know magic school or um, hero's journey as Mad said. Um, so just combining all of those and then wrapping it up in this really interesting um, 
set up where you don't really know what's what's happening in the beginning and then you kind of learn a little bit about this main character but you still really don't know what's happening in the present so there's always that kind of mystery going on so sarah says as y'all said i think it hits a lot of the classic tropes but as we've been talking about it uses a clever kind of formatting that makes it feel fresh i also found it really easy to get absorbed in the book and not pick up my phone or get a snack every five minutes or fall asleep which as i get older is harder and harder to do sarah we can all relate the long length helps with that too even though there were a lot of things that i didn't fully enjoy i couldn't put it down and she wants us all to know she typed that before Emma said um, anything about Robert Jordan. So she's really happy that they both made that connection. She says um, the name of the wind reminded her of a definite classic, The Wheel of Time, in the sense that when we read it, there was so much that made her annoyed, but also so much she loved overall, regardless. And something about it just made her turn page after page. She says, like Emma said, the framing with the silence was also very reminiscent. Well, that was a lot of words to say very little. I wish I could pinpoint what it was. So I think, yeah, overall, we all feel like there's a lot and there's not necessarily one specific thing. So our last question in our spoiler-free section um, is, do you guys want to read the next book in the series? Or if you have, did you like it more or less than the first book? So I probably will not read the next book in the series. Who knows? Maybe I will someday. Um, but my overall feeling about the first book was that a lot of it was really masterful writing. I thought the world building was masterful. Um, but I just never really got engaged in the story. So I don't really necessarily care enough to continue reading. Yeah, I have um, read uh, The Wise Man's Fear. Um, I read it right after I, I did my first read of Name of the Wind. I'm currently rereading it. And um, I actually, I enjoyed it more. I think that um, without getting too spoilery, that the the second book um, gives you a, a broader sense of the world, whereas the or the second book, the first book is very much focused on on the university, and and I like that. Yeah, I too have already read The Wise Man's Fear. When I first read uh, Name of the Wind, I powered straight through to Wise Man's Fear, like without even missing a beat. I think I immediately had downloaded it before I finished uh, Name of the Wind. Uh, I am going to read it again, but from what I remember of The Wise Man's Fear, it's very much like Chris just said in that it expands the world. Like any good sequel should do, you start small in the first book and then you just get a little bit bigger in the next one. And I do remember loving that about the second one. There was, however... Uh, not to be very specific, because spoilers, one section of the second book that I remember not really enjoying the first time around, so I'm curious when I dive back into it this time, what I think. I have not read the second book yet, but I definitely plan on doing so when I can get my hands on it. Um, I had a brief moment of finishing uh, Name of the Wind and wanting to go just download the ebook version, so I had to give myself a bit of a break in between this uh pretty long uh, book and very in-depth character. So when I get my hands on it, I'm going to give it a read. Yeah, so just like Chris and Matt, um, I have already read the second book. Um, again, I read it right after the first book, um, just sped through. So I really, like, on this reread, I didn't really know where the first book was going to end because I just blended them together in my head. So, yeah, I'm probably going to reread it also. Um, not sure when. Yeah, and Sarah says... I did, in reference to whether she has read the second book. Um, she says, I just finished it. I really enjoyed it more than the first, I think. Some of the issues with women that I'm sure we'll discuss later were resolved a bit. Some of the new worlds were introduced, and I found that interesting. There were some sections that dragged on, which I can't call out because spoilers, but wow, did those scenes drag. But in a thousand-page book, that's bound to happen. And there was enough, of, there was enough to interest me to make up for it for me personally. All right, it's spoiler time. So this is going to be our spoiler break. So now, you guys, we can start talking book details and spoilers. Yay! Hooray. <laughs> um, so our first question is going to be, were there parts of the book that you especially enjoyed or parts you did not like? Yeah, parts that I enjoyed, I, I really loved the, the admitted scene where we kind of get introduced to the university. I thought that that was, that was well done and, and was very engaging. I liked the the sort of title confrontation with Ambrose at the very end of the book where, you know, he calls the name of the wind and he does stuff with that. And, um, you know, kind of, I enjoyed that. Um, and the journey to, to Trayvon, which is where he goes and fights the fire lizard, Dracus, is that right? The fire lizard thing. 
and the Aeolian. Um, anytime anything happened at the Aeolian, I, I appreciated that. I, I really didn't appreciate all the time in Tarbian. I thought that that part of the book kind of dragged on a little bit longer than was necessary to sort of, yes, okay, he was in abject poverty, poverty and this was a problem for him. And honestly, all of the other confrontations with Ambrose, it was one of those situations where it's like he kept doing the same thing over and over and over again and kept, you know, pissing off the same guy over and over and over again. And it, it kind of didn't seem believable to me. Yeah, I think in terms of my favorite sequences, uh, just try, I try and pick the ones where, like, I had the biggest emotional reaction or I just connected with them the most. The first being uh, the the death of his parents and the destruction of the troop. I just remember uh, listening to that the first time and just being kind of horrified by that whole thing going on. And you suddenly realize like, okay, so that was the thing that kickstarted him really onto his journey. And that was pretty intense. And actually I felt really bad for him in that scene. Uh, I also loved any of the sequences, uh, like him trying to get his, his pipes, any of the stuff involving music, I really loved. I think just as a musician, I love hearing him talk about music, even if at times it is a little on the side of pretentious and ridiculous. It was just still really entertaining for me as a musician to be like, yes, you are my little subculture. Come to me. This is wonderful. Um, the other couple instances anything with master elodin because i just thought elodin was this weird kooky funny character who i couldn't get enough of the scene where he's being chastised by all the masters for like burning his professor (laughs) where he basically talks himself out of it and they all realize that wait this professor was basically an idiot and challenged both to a like you know lay him out on the table and measure match and tried to embarrass a student. It was, I found that so interesting, the way power dynamics shifted in that scene, and like who was really in control of the scene. And then finally, uh, like I said, I love that penultimate sequence uh, where he, he calls the name of the wind and it's him versus Ambrose. And because that's one of the best moments, I think, of the whole book is that you're just like, yes, finally, title drop, we understand. Um, I want to agree with you, Madeline, about the Aladdin scenes. He was a he was just he's the cookie professor and it was really awesome. I think my favorite thing with him was when Colt follows him to the the madhouse, I guess it is, um, and then it's sort of like trying to think and convince him to teach him uh, naming and he works it up into his head that oh, oh, if I jump off the roof that will show like my true passion for it. <laughs> and he jumps and, and yeah. the professor's just like you're idiot. <laughs> I love that um, scene. <laughs> because leading up to it, I was like, oh, okay, this is how it's going to play out. Yeah, he's going to, like, win the press over because he's won everyone else over. Um, not quite, but, but, like, when he really puts his mind to something, he seems to, to come out on top, as is the case with the, um, the trial in front of all the masters. Um, and then it just completely upends that trope of it, where he jumps off and is not saved and is called an idiot and is just that was really beautiful in my head I also really I like scenes with specific characters uh, I liked the scenes with him and Debbie she's pretty awesome and so at any time with her I got to the, that was the sorry the uh, the verbal wordplay between the two of them uh, was interesting and then actually in the present day section of the book I really liked whenever um, Bast was was talking uh, with the chronicler and he just dropped a lot of hints that I'm very interested to see how they play out. Yeah, I really liked um, basically anything to do with the university. Everything up until he got there was a little bit slow for me. Um, but after yeah, after he got there and went through the um, entrance stuff was all you know pretty awesome. And I, I enjoy having characters who are really smart. So anytime he was like showing up people or just like talking his way out of things, that was always really entertaining. Um, and I agree with with Madeline. The um, the music was really well done. I thought, and Rothfuss really did a really good job of writing out descriptions of of the music without really giving you, you know, actually what it is. Um, although he did, you know, include passages of songs and things like that, um, which again is another great world building thing. I have a question actually for those who read the audiobook, how did the music or the songs play out in that? Was it just read or was there actual like singing or anything? No, it was just read. Okay. 
because that seemed like something that it was a bit boring to read actually it's like reading the lyrics of a song kind of is, is not my cup of tea yeah i don't know though because i was actually i just finished um the auto audio book of ancillary mercy and or whatever the last one was uh, i forget i always get them all confused whatever the third one was but they're in that audiobook, the narrator actually does try to sing them, and sometimes that works, and sometimes it's weird and it kind of pulls me out of it. Yeah, I was actually just trying to remember what that was because I'm actually listening to Ancillary Justice, although I haven't for a while because I started reading Name of the Wind in the middle. But um, yeah, the singing is is interesting. I actually I appreciated all the songs more in the reread because I was listening to the audio, and I guess I just enjoyed hearing them more than actually like reading through. Just sort of like how sometimes. Like poetry is better read aloud than, um, you know, in in text. Um, I don't know. It, even though it wasn't sung, I just kind of liked it more. Sarah says, "Terban o Teban, or whatever the city is called, where Gvoth was homeless before the university dragged on for me." I feel like there were details thrown in that didn't really need to be there that took time, like his feud with the random other kid that didn't come to anything, or maybe he will reappear in another book somehow, who knows. On the other hand, the university was super interesting in comparison. I even liked the tuition system, but Kvothe's constant debt got boring, to be honest. Ambrose got boring too, because I feel like he was poking a bear with a stick at times, but it really solidified him as a dumbass young boy, I guess. And the wind was cool true speaking of all magic and music was good the descriptions were really well done in my opinion but i was also guilty of skimming lyrics um but i do that for any book i agree with everything you guys have said about the good parts basically all class or teacher related things were fun to read i also really like kavoth's university friends and how supportive they were there's too much to name now that i'm thinking about it so basically sarah loved it a lot (laughs) all right and on to this next question which of the characters did you like the most? Which did you dislike? And were you able to keep the characters straight? And a sort of sub-question that goes along with this um, is some of our book club members, a.k.a. me, Rebecca, pointed <laughs> out the lack of real female characters. How do you feel about this and did it bother you? So I'm glad that I get to open this one up because I'm sure you guys are going to talk about totally different things. And that is cool. Um, but if you were in our book club um, discussion, you know that the lack of female characters was like my one thing that drove me crazy. Um, It became somewhat of a running joke Um, for our listeners. I posted updates on when female characters were mentioned or discussed or introduced throughout (laughs) my reading experience. Um, I have yet to come across a book that was written by a female about a female protagonist that doesn't include male characters like from the get-go and particularly like important male characters that are also either protagonists or antagonists um whereas i have found on the flip side especially in fantasy books that are written by men and the protagonist is a male sometimes have this women void and this book had it like no other um it took nine hours, literally, of listening to the audiobook. So I mentioned at the beginning that I think listening to the audiobook didn't help in this regard because I literally had to listen to the book for nine hours before we met like a named female character. Um, and so that bothered me a lot because as interesting as the male characters were to me, the world that was like entirely void of women, like just super super annoyed me and it created sort of a personal resentment um, with Kvothe because people kept pointing out as I was talking about this obviously that he um, that we're also dealing with like Kvothe's perspective and sure there are women in this world but maybe he's not seeing them but as a reader I just can't like I could not engage with that even if you use Kvothe as an excuse partly because in the third person narration we literally never met a woman that void really, really bothered me. And obviously, eventually later we met women. The first is his mother, who is not really that much of a character, but we do meet her and she has a name. Um, and then once he gets to university, we meet some other women that actually have names and some of them even have sort of personalities. Yay. So, yeah, that was one of the reasons it was just really, really, really hard for me to engage with the book as a woman was the fact that I just couldn't believe how women were just so completely ignored and there was this terrible woman void. Um, So otherwise, I would have to say the male characters were extremely well done and very interesting. The Chronicler to me is just like this huge mystery that I would really like to solve and might be the one reason that I will listen to subsequent books, maybe. But 
otherwise, like, I even like Gavoth as a character. I think sometimes he's annoying as hell and he's quite arrogant, but he's really fascinating and his journey is fascinating. I loved Bast. Loved Bast. Um, and Bast, by the way, is the one who points out that in Kavoth's story, there are no women. So there was this weird sort of meta acknowledgement of that. I believe it was in chapter 54, <laughs> where Bast is essentially like, hey, Kavoth, this book is missing women. This story is missing women. So that was interesting. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm going to let you guys talk about all the other characters who I'm sure are amazing and wonderful. But I had to throw my gripe in there. Sort of speaking to that point, I I definitely agree with you. When you first made that comment on the group, I was like, my kind of knee jerk reaction was, no, that's, it's, you know, all the things you said about, you know, quoting being the narrator and everything. But once I started thinking about it, it's not, it's not the intentional choices that are the problem. I think it's the times when there would have been no problem with just, like you said, including one or two female characters with names and, you know, character traits or we're told that university is 10% women. So there are seven masters. It doesn't, you know, stands to reason one of them would have been a woman. Um, so stuff like that. So that's, that's my two cents on the, the female characters thing. I, I, I would agree with you. It wasn't, I don't think is jarring for me and I'm the only male on the podcast. So maybe that's part of it, but um, there were opportunities where he could have done a better job and he didn't take them. So uh, I liked, uh, Kilvin was one of my favorite characters. Um, I liked any time he showed up, any time Quoth was in the fishery. I loved those scenes. Um, I liked Devi as a character. Again, it was one of those, you know, I liked her um, her interactions with Quoth. And, ev- and she seemed to be one of the few characters in the book that managed to knock him off kilter. And every time he interacted with her, he c- sort of didn't know what to do. And I liked the friends, although I couldn't... I didn't think that they had enough personality except for maybe Mehmet to really differentiate them from each other. I just sort of always thought of them as the friends. Yeah. Uh, didn't really like Denna. I just, I can't put my finger on it, but I, I understand that she was the main plot point and his, his, the, you know, his pursuit of her is a main part of the story, but I didn't. Um, and I'm kind of mixed on Kvothe. Sometimes I liked both. Sometimes I didn't. Uh, the the arrogance and the sort of wanting to know everything was was too much. But I think overall, I, I liked him. I do think it's interesting that Denna. I think of all the the female characters who are kind of significant and named, I enjoyed her the least. I sort of found it baffling as to what. Kavoth really likes about her and I, I'm not entirely sure how intentional that is for us because we're not Kavoth and while we're getting his perspective we're not him so whatever he sees in her we might just not be getting <laughs> but I do think um, my, I mean my favorite character I loved uh, Debbie I think it's because both Rebecca and Chris have pointed out that Kavoth is very arrogant that's definitely one of his flaws and, the, and he pretty much just basically thinks he's hot shit at just about everything and the fact that Devi is able to put him completely off kilter, basically to kind of show him up on it and say, oh, honey, you're really not that big of a deal. Like, that's OK. That's cute, pumpkin. And can sort of put him in his place by having the upper hand. I loved watching that. But the fact that, I mean, she's not just nasty. It's not like she's doing it to be mean. She's just like, A, this is the way the world works. B, I'm a businesswoman. I'm doing business. But she was just also really interesting and the little pieces of her backstory and how she'd been in the Arcanum and then wasn't anymore. And the way we were hearing about that, I just found very fascinating. So while we don't get all the pieces of her story, what little pieces we got, I love. My other favorite characters, I think Auri is really just sort of interesting. And in that same vein, I really like Elodin. I think the kind of out there in terms of where exactly are their heads kind of characters, I find fascinating because I want to know how they think. Like, I really want to know how their minds work. And outside of that, I do find Kavoth interesting, despite all of his arrogance and all of his flaws. I think the fact that he has all these flaws in conjunction with the fact that he's the one telling the story is what makes him so fascinating to me. And I will say, I had not thought about the Chronicler all that much before, but Rebecca, hearing you mention him and what you said, I'm now really fascinated in who in the world the chronicler is 
Yeah, I think actually the first time I read this, I didn't really know too much about the book, so I actually thought maybe Chronicler was going to be the main character, because he shows up right at the beginning and has that interesting uh, mugging. (laughs) And yeah, so I always thought, oh, here's our character. As far as other characters, um, I'm pretty much on the same page as Chris. Uh, The friends are all just a group of of guys who, like, one has an accent and one is old, and yeah, they they were great, but like, (laughs) they didn't really, yeah, have that differentiation that you would like i i agree with both of you guys and not liking denna she was just like like there were there are some points in their interactions where i could see maybe that maybe what he saw in her but on the whole she just seemed like she was really flighty it just seemed like she was going from guy to guy and not really being consistent and you know sometimes she was here sometimes she was gone to some random other city um yeah, so so she really wasn't very likable for me either. Something that just occurred to me, oh, and maybe other people have an opinion on this, is it is it possibly because Quoth seems to be so enamored of her without a good reason? Is that maybe why none of us seem to like her as a character? Like, I'm wondering if, if she were just a character in the story and had the same sort of character traits and personality that she has now, um, but he wasn't interested in her. He didn't keep telling us in the narration how wonderful she was if we would feel the same way about her as a character. I think it's that she felt very vacuous as a character. There just wasn't enough to her. She was very not entirely solid in my head, and so for me it was like, he's in love with this girl, but it's like he's in love with the idea of her almost, and I can't put my finger on why I don't like her, and I think it's just that I haven't gotten enough of her outside of the romance so that might be part of it is that when somebody exists purely to be a romantic object male or female i kind of look at them and go but what else this is sort of the curse of having the first person narration is we don't get them outside of whatever that person thinks of them and in this case Kvothe is infatuated he's a little obsessed it's just that is all she is in his mind actually i think that that also was intentional though where denna is concerned um, I will read this in a second, but I know Sarah is frantically typing away about how even Denna we get to more of in the second book. But what was interesting to me is even Kvothe's introduction of Denna, um, which I laughed hysterically about and included this in our group, is Kvoth is explaining her. And he's like, you know, like, she's super pretty. And they're like, okay, she's super pretty. She has, like, this hair and super red lips, even without makeup, you know, like, because apparently that's the most important thing in the world. And then Kvothe is like, no, but also, like, there was so much more than that. Like, she was, like, really great and, like, everything about her was great and whatever. But then when they push him for more, he's basically like, and she was really pretty. (laughs) And it's sort of this really funny, like, meta commentary on it that I think also became part of the narration. And I'm hoping if you guys have read the second that you might have more to say on this. But I really do think that part of Denna is just super colored by the fact that we're hearing about her from Kvoth, who at least at that stage in the narration basically is just like doe-eyed, like I'm in love with you. Because I can't really tell you anything about Denna other than the fact that like Kvoth really wanted her. The rest of us are going to be sitting there like, just like Bast and the Chronicler, like, okay, tell us more about her. And all you really get is, okay, but I really wanted her. Like she was really beautiful. Well, yeah, I mean, if you ask me to name like, all right, tell me something about Denna. The first thing I would say is she's flighty. Like she, they, he keeps going over and over again about I can't find her and looking for Denna is such a waste of time because she's never where you think you're going to be. And he talks about it in, in a way it's that he, he finds it attractive. Whereas, to, you know, to me, if if I was, you know, pursuing somebody and that was the way they were and I set a date with them and then they didn't show up or I didn't see them for two weeks or whatever, that would be a turn off for me. But Apparently he digs it. He'd be gr- He's great at long distance re- relationships, air quotes, <laughs> around relationships. It feels sort of like that trope of like the, the thrill to chase sort of thing. Like he never quite get her, so he never figures out how annoying she is. I don't know if she is annoying because he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> going off of her, um, I think my one of the reasons that Debbie is my favorite character, just like in terms of the female characters, versus the lack of them. Um, she actually has some authority, at least over Coast. And uh, as Chris mentioned, that as uh, Chris mentioned, even like in the Masters, there isn't a female master. Like there's no one that we see in authority. All the pub owners or the like 
tavern owners or that a lot of the shopkeepers even are all male. And so like the few bits of female we get that are in authority is Devi over Quoth. And I think that she holds her own against him. And I think that's why I really like her. I mean, an argument could be made that Denna has some authority over Quoth and that she controls when she's around him, but that just makes her annoying because he's so obsessed with her. She hasn't, hasn't given us any information that would make us like her. Yeah, and she she really makes Quoth make pretty bad decisions. Like, he's always, like, throwing everything away and going to meet her or, like, um, yeah, just, just doing things that, you know, throw, throwing some other tasks that he has um, to the side and just, you know, dropping everything, which really, I mean, it seems like it's not really, he's not getting much out of it. Um, oh, but I also wanted to say that I really liked Ari. Uh, I don't know if I said that right. Um, even though we don't get that much of her here, um, it seems like she brought out a different side of Quoth. Like, he was really kind around her, he brought her things, he uh, kind of went along with the way she named things and had her own, like, little world, and he was he was really like a different person with her. I feel like he lost a lot of his arrogance um, around her. And that's one of the reasons I liked her a lot. So Sarah says, what I have to say about specific characters has mostly already been touched on, but I do have a bit to say about how Kvoth presents characters to us. I feel like there was a gap in our knowledge regarding a lot of characters, including 99% of the female characters, or for another example, the helpful barefoot guy in turban, which made it hard for me to connect with them at first. What I mean is that Kvoth often skips over his introduction to, or the time spent getting to know characters, and then drops their names as if we already know them. An example of this is how it skips from Kvoth finding a hint that Ari exists, and then suddenly she is his BFF. Or how Mola is mentioned as a background character, but then suddenly they are close enough for Kvoth to call on her for a sudden favor. I felt in the case of the barefoot guy or Mola, it was like we missed our chance to get to know them, and they were just used for a scene and then discarded. In the second book, some of these characters are fleshed out much further. Ari goes on to be one of my favorites, and the kind of strange time gaps seem to be done in a less jarring manner. I feel like all of the female characters felt significantly more real in the second book, including Denna. We finally saw a tiny bit of her real personality and real fears or motivations and personal goals, and not just Kvothe's infatuation with her sexy red lips and her sexy dark hair. Anyway, so in other words, I think the major problem is that they just took way too long to be introduced. I already mentioned the red lips, every woman is a hottie thing, so I won't harp on that. What was the most influential factor in drawing you in or turning you off the book? So we can pick a passage, a character, a scene, an idea, etc. Um, so for me, the turning off is going to be the woman thing, which we already talked about. And then the most influential factor for me in drawing me into the book was actually I was told. So when I was complaining over and over and over again about the woman thing and about how I was having a hard time engaging with the book, a friend of mine said, just read until the sympathy chapter. And if you hate it still after the sympathy chapter, put it down. You'll never like the book. And it didn't actually take me that long because it was his entrance in and the tuition chapter the, um, to the university where for some reason, once that happened, I just like the story super clicked and I was like, OK, I actually am interested in where this is going. And I think it was a lot of the conversations that happened in there, the teachers and that were introduced um, and even just the whole thing that happened with the tuition discussion um, I just, that was like a shining moment for me in terms of the thing that made me decide, yes, this book is worth my time, even I sit here and grumble, grumble, grumble about the women issue. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that because I think the the main thing that drew me into this book was the, the, uh, the concept of sympathy and the magic system. It just in, you know, and I love the Harry Potter books, but there's not a whole lot of rhyme or reason to the way that magic works in that, you know, in that universe. And that's okay. It's not what sort of the focus of the book is, but I, you know, the fact that there's all these thermodynamic principles and links and um, uh, calculations and all that kind of stuff to somebody like, I mean, I'm uh, an engineering grad student and I don't know, something about that sort of spoke to the, the analytical side of my mind. And I really, I really appreciated that. Um, if, if anything turned me off, it was probably there. There were some parts of the book that were just repetitive, or some ideas that came back over and over again, and I started to get kind of tired of that. Yeah, I think what drew me into the book, interestingly enough, was kind of part of how I found it. Uh, so I didn't really know anything about this book, but for a time period, I worked at a Barnes and Noble, and 
I used to get asked a lot by people who didn't know, they would say, oh, when's the third book in this series coming out? And I was like, I'd never heard of it. I'd never read it. But after searching for it so many times or taking so many people to say, oh, it's in this section. Here it is. Here's the second book or whatever. I finally picked up just like the, the first book. I picked up The Name of the Wind and I went and I decided to read what was on the back. And what's on the back of any hard copy or if you've got a hard back, you open it up and see inside flap is the part where, quote, introduces himself. He says, you know, my name is Quoth, pronounced nearly the same as Quoth. Names are important, as they tell you a great deal about a person. And it's this whole little introduction as to who Quoth is in his own words. I just went, this is a really strange and interesting introduction. And I wasn't sure if it was part of the story or just part of the marketing. But I went, okay, now I'm curious. And it takes about like 50 pages to get to that passage. As I kept reading my curiosity about this world and then this person as they're experiencing it just grew and grew and grew. So I was kind of already sucked in before I realized I was sucked in. I actually had a pretty similar experience. I'd heard a lot about this book and Patrick Rothfuss and how like wonderful it was. And I'd heard it from people who's reading uh, Experience I Trust, but I'd never quite picked it up. It seemed one of those things that was so popular it could never live up to the hype. And then I picked up the back of it, and I actually have my copy here. Like, the first bit is just, like, my name is Ko. I've stolen princesses back from Sleeping Barrow Kings. And just, like, his introduction is on the back. And I was like, okay, this sounds interesting. And I bought the book. Um, but then I didn't actually pick it up to read it until uh, this book club uh, happened. And I think the thing that definitely kept me going was, at first, like, yeah, where where is this Ko? Why are we in a pub? Who are these random people? Oh, okay, there he is. And then, sorry, just the whole design of the story within a story and the, the storytelling aspect really helps to, to suck you in. And that's what kept me reading it. Yeah, same. I just kept wanting to know what was happening in the past in the story. Um, and I have to agree that I also really loved the magic system. I knew nothing about it before we, we got there. But then, you know, it was just, yeah, it was pretty different from anything I'd read before. And again, the, the sort of scientific aspects of it. Um, also really appealed to me. And then at the university, just all, like, the different subjects they have that are all, like, slightly magical or, like, slightly more like chemistry or then the the naming that's really just, like, very abstract and, and ha- you have no idea, like, how that even happens or anything. Yeah, and Sarah says basically the magic system and the university system. So both of those things are the things that really drew her in. So diving in then from what Sarah just said, um, the main plot line of the story within the story is Kavoth's admittance to the university and instruction there. Um, so do you guys like the magic system as compared to other fantasy novels? And how about the system of magical instruction as compared to other novels like Harry Potter, Earthsea, The Magicians, etc.? So my thoughts are going to be pretty brief here. Um, I thought the magic system was really, really interesting. Um, I felt like it didn't have as many holes as I tend to find in other fantasy novels where you're like, oh, well, why does that work? Um, but in terms of how the magical instruction was compared to other novels, um, I just, I found it really fascinating. It was way less like your traditional university system than I expected, although there were still parts that were pretty traditional university. Um, I think because this was an adult novel versus like Harry Potter, Earthsea is kind of a bridge YA adult. I guess The Magicians is an adult novel, um, but it just felt like the consequences were very real and the level of magic and the things that could be done with it, I felt like were a deeper, potentially darker thing than in a lot of like magical instruction stories yeah i mean i like i said i already mentioned that this was one of my favorite aspects of the novel and just um you felt like the the basis was there for if he wanted to spend you know 100 pages talking about all the various you know applications of you know sigildry and um alchemy and all this kind of stuff that 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 exists in this world it it feels very deep and complex and logical and like something you would go to a university to study. All right. Well, it looks like we're running out of time for tonight, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. As you can tell, there's an overwhelmingly positive response to The Name of the Wind, and I think overall we would say, yes, we definitely recommend if you want to take a read. Don't miss us next month. We'll be talking about storytelling in video games. Um, So we're taking a little bit of a step away from our discussions about books and sort of specific genres of books. And we're having fun with something else that 
People in our group have loved as fantasy readers, so yay, new things. All right, hope you enjoyed. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash thebooktable. The Book Table is a podcast from Backroom Whispering Productions. Our theme music is by Mark Wayne. If you like this podcast, rate us on iTunes, or get in touch with us on Twitter at Backroom Whisper, on Facebook at facebook.com slash backroomwhispering, or by email, backroomwhispering at gmail.com. Tune in again next time.